So we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and we, we began the first part of this kind of talking about the idea of who the Holy Spirit is, you know, the Trinity. We talked about being born of the Spirit. We talked about sanctifies us and changes us. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. And then last week we talked about, you know, how a person can be led by the Spirit. And now we're going to start making a little bit of a shift now and start talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So there is something called being born of the Spirit and something called being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So today we're going to make that shift. And what I wanted to share before we even talk about that is what exactly is a charismatic church? You know, if you look on our website, you'll find things in there under the belief system that says something like, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. And that is a way that uh, churches identify themselves or people to understand who they are going to visit, for example. And you may know or you may not know what exactly is a charismatic church. And that's what I want to share with you today. And then why do we do what we do? You know, why do we do certain things? And then you might also have in your mind what you think a charismatic church is, and you're wondering why we don't do some of the things other charismatic churches do. I mean, there's certain things we do do, certain things we don't do, and you think, are they really a charismatic church? And I hope at the end of the day, you'll come away and say yes, and maybe you'll have some understanding as to why why we are sort of a strange plant. Well, most historians, and I'm going to do, this is going to be a little bit different message for me because I'm going to be doing some history and some of that kind of stuff, so bear with me. Um, I will have some scriptures. But most historians, they break up what are called like the movements of the Holy Spirit through, through time really beginning actually around 1906 with something called the Azusa Street Revival. Anybody ever heard of that before? That was in 1906. And most historians will divide up into three, what they call three waves, how the Holy Spirit has moved in, in the world and in our country since that time. There's wave one, which was the Azusa Street Revival, began there. There's wave two, which began like in the 1960s, called the charismatic movement. Then there's something called wave three, which is kind of what we're in now. They call it the neo-charismatic. And I want to explain those different moves. But I like to think that there's four of them. Can anybody guess what the fourth one might be? It's the original. <laughs> because sometimes when you think about, you know, charismatic, Pentecostal, you think, well, that's really such a strange thing. How did that even come about? But you need to know that it was God's intention from the beginning. When the church began, there was a Pentecostal move of God. And, and the very things that people who are, quote unquote, Pentecostal or charismatic experienced at the very beginning of the church. And so I want to read in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived. So why do they call them Pentecostals? Because... What happened on the day of Pentecost is kind of what happens to people who are called Pentecostal. They, they receive the Holy Spirit and they speak in tongues. And so the same kind of experience happened. They said, what do we call these people? Tonguers? <laughs> Filled people? What do we call them? Let's call them Pentecostal because um, they're experiencing what happened on the day of Pentecost. And the day of Pentecost was simply a feast of Israel that happened 50 days after uh, Passover. And so 50 is the word, Pentecost means 50, 50 days. That's all it is. So a Pentecostal is somebody who experienced something like what happened at Pentecost. So when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a, a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. Now, think about this. How awesome would that be? You're in this room. All of a sudden, you hear this wind and then fire comes down and it starts landing on the heads of everybody. 
That's a pretty amazing. And then all of a sudden it says they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So there was this, a lot of different manifestations. There was wind, there was fire, there was a filling of the Spirit that took place, and these people spoke in languages. They didn't know as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I like to take another scripture I want to add to this, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, because you don't want to forget what the intention of the baptism of the Holy Spirit was for. Why did the Lord give us the Holy Spirit? Why did he want us to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? Why did he make, make it such an urgent plea to his disciples? And it's this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. So, when you think about why does God want the church to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it's because he wants to take the message of Jesus around the world. That's the bottom line. It's not so we can get goosebumps. You might get a goosebump, but it's not what the Lord, that's not his main purpose. His main purpose is that you would be filled with power, filled with the Holy Spirit, so, like, like, so imbued with God that you can't help but tell people. That's what he wants. The message of Jesus is meant for every human being on this planet. There's 8 billion people living in the world today. And he gives us his Holy Spirit so we can go and be a witness for him. I hope you never forget that. So why these three waves? One reason, I believe, is the church needed to be restored. When you think about it, for the first probably 1,400 years or 1,500 years, the church had fallen away in a sense. It had, it had become so caught up with tradition, political entanglements of different kinds. They institutionalized the church. And we lost, the church lost so much of what God had instituted in the beginning. And so you find there's a story about a guy named Martin Luther that came around. And he began to see that, hey, we don't, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by giving indulgences. He's reading the book of Romans. He realizes we're saved by grace through faith alone. And so he goes and he nails 95 different theses up on the door of a church and says, hey, we need to change what we're doing here. And, of course, the church received him beautifully. No, the church rejected him. The church rejected him because they were so institutionalized. And so what happened? The Lutheran church began. All of a sudden, denominations began to be formed. But it was, it was an effort of the Lord to bring back something that was lost. Aren't you glad that Martin Luther had the boldness and the courage to stand up and say, hey, here's what the scripture says. Well, then shortly afterwards, somebody got an idea that they were reading in the Bible, and they said, hey, looks like to me we're supposed to be baptizing believers, not infants. And, of course, the church at that time was baptizing the infants. And these people stood up and said, hey, God brought back salvation to the church. He's bringing back baptism to the church. And they were gladly received by the Lutherans. Not really. They were also rejected, so they spun off, and you had the Anabaptist movement. So God was restoring something, but people had a hard time receiving it. And instead of adding to what was already there, they said, let's just start a new denomination. So you had the Amish and the Mennonite and the Hutterite. All these came out of the Anabaptist movement. Too bad that Luther didn't accept it but it was something that God was trying to restore, to rediscover. Well, then, guess what else was lost to the church? The baptism in the Holy Spirit. And it took almost two millennium to get that one back. Although there were smatterings of people filled with the Spirit through the centuries, and I have a document I can share with you if you want to see it, but God also restored the baptism in the Holy Spirit to a a man who was a black man during a time of great segregation 
He was pulled aside into a small warehouse-looking building, met with people who were really the down and out, the poor of the community. And he, this guy was blind in one eye. He wouldn't even preach. He would get up there and put his head inside of a box, it said. He would just, they're back there, they're praying and saying, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. They were seeking God. And on a certain night, there were seven people there who were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues, just like Pentecost. And the church wonderfully accepted them. No. Just like the other times, they were rejected. They were pushed away, and they began to start their own denominations. You have denominations you're maybe familiar with, Assemblies of God, or the Four Square Church, or United Pentecostal. Believe it or not, I read that there are today 700 Pentecostal denominations in the world today. And there have been many, many more, many more, like you want to call them rediscoveries or restorations that have happened over the years. But those three are so important because they're foundational to our walk with Jesus. When the people asked Peter, what must I do to be saved? What must we do? They heard about Jesus being crucified by them. They said, men and brothers, what must we do? Peter said, repent. That's salvation. Be baptized. That's water baptism. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. That was foundational. That was their initiation into the, the church, into the kingdom. And those things were lost to the church for so many years. And God is graciously restoring. So he brought it back. And so it's come to us now in these three waves. The first wave is called the Pentecostal movement. You know, the Pentecostal movement had its roots in Methodism, if you want to believe that or not. How many here used to be a Methodist before you were born again? Raise your hand real high. All right. That, That was the roots of Pentecost. The Methodist church, the Holiness church, and the Wesleyan church. Those were people who were seeking the Lord in a different way, seeking for holiness, seeking for what they called a second experience. And eventually that morphed into people understanding that it was the baptism of the Holy Spirit they were really seeking out. Um, There were seven people, uh, as I mentioned on the note there, they were rejected by the church. They started their own denominations. But today, from seven people, 118 years later, there are 279 million Pentecostal. I'm talking about old, old line Pentecostal people in every nation of the world. When those people got filled with the Spirit, they thought when they received their gifts of tongues, they were given languages to actually go preach the gospel in other nations, and they would go. And when they got there, they realized, I'm not actually speaking that language, am I? <laughs> But, but they had a heart to evangelize. And look, look what they've done. 279 million people. Then there was a second wave. It was called the Charismatic Movement. It began in 1960. There was an Episcopal priest by the name of Dennis Bennett. He was just seeking God. He, he wanted more of God. And he was praying one day, and he got, he got filled with the Spirit. And he started speaking in tongues. And so he came to his church one morning, Episcopal Church, and he announced to them, I have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the church graciously accepted him. (laughs) Now, they rejected him. He was basically kicked out of the church. They couldn't receive it. Somehow, Time and Newsweek magazine got a hold of this story, and they wrote about it. And it became almost like the igniter that caused knowledge of this to go into our nation. And this, this experience called the charismatic. Why do they call it charismatic instead of Pentecostal? Because charismatic comes from a Greek word, charis, which is the word grace, like a gift from God, a, gr- a grace from God. And the charismatic church is one who were pursuing the gifts of the Spirit, charismatic. Still Pentecostal in nature, but a different name, a different movement. And what was unique about the charismatic movement that was different than the Pentecostal movement is the charismatic movement was received within those mainline denominations. 
So you had Anglicans and Presbyterians and Baptists. Every denomination began to see the Holy Spirit's moving in this way. And so instead of rejecting it, they embraced it. And so you see it's like a, a step forward, a step in the right direction. Now many of these mainline churches are receiving the Holy Spirit. They're pursuing God and they're understanding that God wants to move in a different way in our life and in our church. This guy, 64 years ago, was one man. Today, they estimate 305 million charismatic. That's on top of the 279 million Pentecostal. 305 million charismatics in our world today. Started with one man. Pretty amazing, isn't it? How the Lord begins to work. He's, because it's a wave of his spirit. When we first started our church, there weren't that many charismatics around. We all kind of felt like embarrassed. We're not embarrassed anymore. Because there's millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of people around the world who are, who are being swept into this wave of God's movement because he wants to save people. That's it. He wants to save people. The charismatic renewal even spread to the Catholic Church. Can you imagine that? My mother was a charismatic Catholic. Some of you might know other people in the Catholic Church. It seems strange to us. If you were God, you probably wouldn't have done that, would you? <laughs> but God somehow made it known within the Catholic Church. And today, well, actually in 2013, so 46 years after it started, there's 160 million Catholic charismatics in the world. 160 million you say, well, I, I don't believe that could even happen. Well, you have to take it up with the Lord. I've, I've come to this place, I'm telling you, after reading some of this stuff, I've come to this place where I'm just saying, if you're a friend of Jesus, you're a friend of mine. That's all I can say. Sometimes some of this stuff doesn't line up with my theology or what I might think should happen, but the Lord saw fit to bring others, to bring others in to help them see there's something different, something more. The Catholic Charismatic Movement began at a weekend retreat in 1967. There was like 25 college students and two faculty members who came together and they said, we want something more of God. And they began to pray. And they, they were seeking the Lord and they were praying. And they, they, they kind of were spending some time around the book of Acts. And they realized that God wanted to pour out his Holy Spirit. And so they began to pray and seek the Lord. And that night, one of the boys went into a room and began to pray. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues. And he came out and he was telling everybody. And then another, another one of the young girls there prayed and she was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I think before the weekend was over, not all of them, but a handful of them had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that this thing just caught like wildfire. And eventually the Pope actually heard about it and began to embrace it and accept it and spread it out. And so, as I said, 46 years later, there's 160 million Catholics around the world. Now, to give you some perspective, 46 years, that's how long Alliance Christian Center has existed. From the time our church began until now, there have been 160 million Catholic people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that amazing? That, I mean, that's amazing to me. About the third wave. Third wave is called neo-charismatic. It's mostly made up of independent and non-denominational evangelicals. Evangelicals are sort of a generic term that just means people that believe the basic you know, Orthodox Christianity. They, they, they spread through many different dom, denominations and so forth. And then even today, there's something called the non-denominational church, which is what we are. We're not really part of any specific denomination, but we're Orthodox. You know, we, we believe the Bible. And so this neo-charismatic movement is made of people like that. 
they embrace the gifts of the Spirit. At the same time, they do reject some of the classic Pentecostal teachings, such as they don't believe necessarily that it's a second work after salvation. And some of them don't believe that it's necessary to speak in tongues as an evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's called the third wave. It's neat because it's not necessarily part of a denomination. It's something that's sort of like an overlay, people from all different places. But they're also being filled with the Holy Spirit. Think of things like Calvary Chapel or the Vineyard Church. Abbott Loop was probably similar to that, although we're, we're probably more second, second wave you know, in reality. But in this, in this movement, it began maybe 44 years ago, somewhere in the 1980s. Today, there are 295 million neo-charismatics in the world today. Does this blow your mind? So no matter what, no matter what you think of it, these waves of the Holy Spirit are no small thing. You're talking about almost a billion people, a little over a billion people in 118 years that have been affected by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that began at a little black man's church in Los Angeles in 1906. And people got on fire for Jesus. Is there a future wave? I don't know. That's up to the Lord, but if it were... Here's how I think it might happen. In the last couple of years, I've met with people who are really engaged deeply with making disciples, discipleship and evangelism, and really focused on reaching what are called unreached people groups. They're people who don't have any Christian history. There's no, no one there reaching them. It's like brand new. If you walk into their country, they've never heard about Jesus, and they're, they're beginning to target these people. Well, guess what's happening? Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people are coming to Christ as a result of these efforts. And to me, if there's any move where the Holy Spirit can go next, it's there. And the neat thing about it is, is a lot of the people that are, are going as these missionaries, they don't believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They don't believe in miracles. They believe it ended back in the first century. And yet they're walking into these places and they believe the word of God, and they see where the Bible says, lay your hands upon the sick and they'll be healed. And they walk over. And I've, I've been on phone calls talking to these people. I'm not talking about something that I've heard. I'm, I'm talking to these people face to face. They walk in to a room where there's a blind person. They pray for him, and the guy can see. And the guy's like, I don't even believe this. <laughs> but look what the Lord is doing. And you know what they're saying? I've got to change my theology. And if there is to be another wave, I, I hope it's there. I hope it's with these people that are focused on, because it, it kind of grew, ex, you know, like, like in stages. You know, first kicked out of their churches, they start their own. Then accepted within the denominations. Now accepted within the evangelical church. And now maybe among the unreached people groups, because if you think of a, being about a billion people, touched by the Holy Spirit in this manner, that's one out of eight people in our world today. So nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to hide. Some of you might feel like every time you invite a friend to church, you're, you're afraid someone's going to get up and speak in tongues. Don't worry about it. Right. Let them stand up and speak in tongues. The Lord wants to touch people. Right. <laughs> Why should we be ashamed of something that's in the Bible? Well, as I mentioned to you, 700 denominations have come out of the Pentecostal movement. That's a lot. <laughs> and a lot of that's because we can't agree on everything. So aren't you glad you found the right place? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we can't agree. We can't agree, and that's okay. You know what? The Lord's going to sort all that out. The Lord's going to sort all that out. But... It requires of us to say, how do, we, how do we maintain biblical integrity in the midst of a world where there's so much difference in a, in a spiritual or Holy Spirit, quote-unquote, environment? 
So for example, you'll find some Pentecostal churches are what you might call a holy roller. You think, I don't want to go to a holy roller church and be swinging from the chandeliers. And so you get that picture. Or, you know, there are people who do snake handling. I don't know if you've ever heard of that before, but they'll read the scriptures in Mark 16 about they shall take up serpents. They literally do this. If you, I've seen videos of these people online. They'll walk in and they'll take up serpents. How many of you are glad that we haven't pursued that side of the Holy Spirit? They're, they're out there. Another Pentecostal denomination is focused on outward holiness. So the women never cut their hair. They wear long dresses. The men wear certain clothes. It's, it's outward holiness. That's a Pentecostal denomination. They're filled with the Spirit. They love Jesus. They're just walking in it differently than you do. Some of those churches are what we might call word of faith church and preach a, what's called a prosperity gospel. We have to discern these things and say, hey, is this really biblical? Or should we take a different path? And you have one group called the Oneness Pentecostal that denies the Trinity, which is a really serious problem. So, and I just gave you a little smattering of that. So what do you do? Do you say, well, look, there's so much weird stuff within the charisma. I guess I'm just not going to be involved in that. That's not the answer. The answer is, yeah, there's weirdness. There is weirdness. Let, let's be honest. There's weirdness within this movement. But the Bible is still the Bible. And that's where we have to land. We have to have enough in our heart to be able to say, hey, I see this weirdness, but the word of God is the word of God. Let's maintain our integrity in the scripture. Try to sort it out. Be wise and discerning. But let's do what the Bible says in spite of that. So I have here three risks in this current environment. One is accessibility. The internet is so full of both good and bad. You're going to find good teaching. You're going to find bad teaching. You're going to find awesome things. You're going to find weird things. And I tend to think that most Christians end up finding weird things because I get them sent to me sometimes. Hey, check this out. Check that out. So I don't know, man. That seems a little bit weird to me. So that is a, a risk, but it's, it's the reality of our world today. What does that mean? Well, it means we need to be in the Word so we can discern what's right and what's wrong. We can discern a path. We can be able to look at something and say, oh, yeah, I see what they're doing. I see what they're saying, but here's what the Scripture says. There's no substitute for being strong in the Word. Remember George shared last week about the two-winged bird, having the Holy Spirit and having the Word. You've you got to have both. Another one is lack of accountability. Another risk in this current environment is lack of accountability because there are so many independent groups out there that are, that are receiving the Holy Spirit and doing things. No one is there to speak into their life. You know, where are the people who brought correction to all the prophets who prophesied about President Trump being reelected? Where's, where's the correction? Where's the accountability? There has to be, because otherwise, this puts a blight on the face of Jesus in our world today. We have to be able to stand up in a church and say, hey, you know what? We believe God was going to do this. We spoke this. We prophesied, but we missed it. We were wrong. And have enough integrity to be able to do that. Now, you might say, well, I thought you were speaking for the Lord. How could it be wrong? Well, the Bible tells us that there is a human element involved in this. It tells us that we're supposed to correct prophecy. We're supposed to judge it. It tells us we prophesy according to the proportion of our faith. So just because somebody stands over here and gives a prophecy or a word of knowledge or an interpretation, that's not equal with the word of God. That's a person who's standing up, trying to be used by the Lord, but they're under scrutiny. And they're, they're being judged, and that should be a comfort to all of us that that's the case. And, and it gives people a chance to stretch, to learn, to grow, and try to be used by the Lord, try to understand what he's trying to say. But there is a great lack of accountability today in many of these strong voices that are out there, and it's, it's a danger. 
Last risk I see is what, what I would call just hero worship, and that is some people become so famous, so powerful in some ways that they become the focus. You know, it's so-and-so's ministry. It's so-and-so this. Hey, you want to be healed? Go see so-and-so. No, you're, the healing happens in the body of Christ. God wants you to lay your hands upon the sick. If you're sick, you don't need to go to a revival meeting. You just call your brother and say, can you pray for me? Now, I'm not saying don't go to the meeting. I'm just saying that it, it becomes like a, that becomes the focus. No one can be healed unless it's this person. That's, that's really one of the reasons why I don't really do altar calls a lot. I know people ask me, why don't you guys do altar calls? Well, number one, they're not in the Bible. Can I say that and be okay? They're not really in the Bible. It's just a, a methodology for people to respond. But I don't want anybody to think that the only way you can be prayed for is if Kirk Martin prays for you. Or the only way you can get good counsel is if Kirk Martin counsels you. The only way you can get a healing is if Kirk Martin lays his hands upon you. I don't believe that's what the Lord wants. So pray for one another. Lead someone to the Lord in the park. You know, pray for a healing in your living room. You know what I mean? It's that kind of a thing. So hero worship is another. The only one I want to be a hero to is Ruth. <laughs> I'm your hero. I'm your <laughs> <laughs> Took me a lot of years. Took me a lot of years to get that. <coughs> how, do, how does the church maintain biblical integrity while being full of the Spirit? Don't you think both are necessary? Amen. One, be a student of the Word. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of God. Learn how to rightly divide the scripture. Not every scripture is a mandate to put something into practice. How many of you know the Bible says, My servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years. <laughs> what would you do with that? My servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for three years. All right, brothers. Here we go. We got three years. See, you, would, you understand that that was just a story. It's not something that you apply to your life. And so sometimes we take things out of that kind of a context. You know, we'll read something. In, in the charismatic world, there's something we'd call prayer cloth. Now, do I, am I against a prayer cloth? No. If, if God tells you to pray over cloth and take it to somebody, do it. But I'm telling you, he's telling us it's an extraordinary miracle by the hands of Paul. It's a story. And it may not be necessarily something we put into practice. It's a story, something that happened. And yet in the, in the charismatic world, we almost make a ministry out of it. Not every practice has scriptural basis, like I mentioned altar calls or things like that. Some teaching is due to poor, what we call exegesis. That's just a, fam that's a big word that just means how you interpret scripture. Sometimes people have bad doctrine because they, it's just poor. It's, they're not handling the word of God correctly. That doesn't mean they're a heretic. We're very loose with the word heretic these days. Somehow the Lord wants to bring unity to his church, even among all these people that have all these different opinions about things. And, and it's going to be hard to do that when we're calling everybody who disagrees with you a heretic. So sometimes it's just bad teaching. It's, bad, it's, it's, there, it's just an error. It's not a heresy. Try to understand the difference. Paul was able to have a relationship with Peter, even though Peter was doing things kind of weird with the Galatians, kind of siding with the Jews who were thinking they should be circumcised. And they didn't call him a heretic. They, they, worked, they worked out the problem, and they still maintained fellowship. But then there were times when Paul did call out people who were heretics. Hymenaeus and Philetus were a couple, and they were leading people astray, and he did call that out. So there, there's a balance there. Sometimes you need to. Um, use wisdom and discernment. Second thing you can do as a church, use wisdom and discernment. 
be accountable. If you have ever seen someone abuse the gift of tongues or heard about a prophet that prophesied it didn't come to pass, understand what it is. Don't throw the Bible out. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Somebody blew it. Somebody was in error. Somebody missed it. The Bible is still the word of God. Um, number three, the last thing I guess I'll say to you is people are emotional and impressionable. What do I mean by that? Well, when you start seeing in the charismatic world people doing all kinds of things that seem neat, just know that sometimes we do things because it's, it's the crowd. You know, if people are being slain in the spirit, I'm going to do a courtesy fall. You know, because it's not that God has done something in your life necessarily. It's just like you're trying to go along with the group. If somebody prays for you for a healing and you're not healed, don't go around saying you're healed. Be honest. Be people of integrity. Jesus doesn't need that. Now, you're walking around with your bone out of your arm and saying, I'm healed. This is just the symptoms. No, your arm is still broken. Your arm is still broken. Jesus doesn't need that. You know what I mean? So people are very emotional, very impressionable. We just need to be honest, truthful, full of integrity, and upfront. And I think if we do those things, God will help us to be, to be full of integrity, be full of the word, to walk in the truth of God's word, and at the same time allow the fullness of the spirit to work in our lives. I want to share one last scripture in John 16. When the spirit of truth comes, that's the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth. That's the word of God. You know, you're going to find that when you are a man of the spirit or a woman of the spirit, you are in the word. He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will declare to you things that are to come and he will glorify me. One of the, to me, the hallmark of a person filled with the Spirit is they're glorifying Jesus. They're not glorifying themselves. They're not glorifying a ministry. They're not glorifying tongues. They're not glorifying healing. They're not glorifying the gifts of the Spirit. They're glorifying Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit came to do. He will be on your lips. You'll be pointing people to him. That's the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, Jesus said, for he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. I'd like you to stand with me. That was a little bit longer than I normally like to go, but I uh, hope it gives you some idea of what's happening in the world today, in the charismatic world, why there are, there are strange things that are happening. You know, a lot of them are these divisions, disagreements have come along the way, but that just means that we have to be more discerning to know what do we embrace, what do we avoid, what do we leave out of the way. I, I feel like we've done a pretty good job of it. I don't want to say we're perfect. and I don't want to say that we're beyond missing it in some area. But I feel like we have a, a good balance in the church. I would like to keep it that way. But let's be men and women of the word. And let's pursue the spiritual gifts even more than we are now. Pursue them and let, let the Lord use us in powerful ways. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, I, I've been, I'm amazed at how many people have been touched by your Holy Spirit over this last century. And yet there are still 7 billion people, Lord, in this, in this planet who need a touch from you. There are many of those that are saved. Many of those have never heard about you. And you've given your Holy Spirit that they might be reached. So I pray, Lord God, that you would fill us with your spirit. Fill us again and again, Lord God. Use us. Stir up our hearts to pursue you and the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. Use us as your instruments to share your word, Lord God, that others might come into place of knowing you as Lord and Savior. And we pray that we, you would always help us, Lord, to be balanced and direct and full of wisdom as we seek to know what is in your word and how do we parse all this out with all the things that are happening in the charismatic world. Help us to find balance and good guidance from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have a need for prayer, please feel free to come up and uh, we'll pray with you. Otherwise, take some time to share your love. Meet somebody you don't know, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>